So, another day, another episode of the self to World More Tactics podcast or SDWT. Today we're going to go through something philosophy related. Um, funny anecdote. Every time when somebody asks me what I'm doing on a podcast, you know, what I'm talking about and whatnot, I most often say that I'm talking about philosophy or I'm being philosophical about things and whatnot, which essentially is the truth. But, you know, it is, well, you know, probably a minor part of everything that the podcast is all about. But anyway, today it's actually going to be philosophy related, even though, I mean, I do want to point out, first of all, it's not a lie. Second of all, I do go through a lot of philosophy related things. I mean, every second video kind of is about, or podcast episode therefore as well, is about stoicism and or somehow stoicism related. Anyway, today we're going to go through a book by Aristotle, which I think is very interesting. I haven't read any bit of the summary, which is, by the way, provided by the best book bits.com site. As always, the link is going to be down in the description. So if you want to check it out, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, even though I don't know the book, but I like the website, even though I know that they are kind of um, stealing those summaries from other places. But yeah, I mean, anyway, the book is called The Nicomachean Ethics or Nicomachean. I don't actually know how to pronounce it. Is there actually maybe was a, a mathematician and Pythagorean philosopher from Gerasa. Uh, Nicomachus may also refer to, well, Nicomachian or Nicomachus. Anyway, introduction. Aristotle was born in Stagira in Macedon, now part of northern Greece in 384 BC. In 367 BC, Aristotle came to Athens and was a member of Plato's academy until the death of Plato in 347. In 334, he returned to Athens, or Athens, whatever, and founded his own school, the Lucian. In 323, Alexander died in the resulting outbreak of anti-Macedonian feeling in Athens, or Athens. Aristotle left for Chalcis on the island of Euboea, where he died in 322 BC. Wait a second. Well, anyway. Happiness is the right starting point for an ethical theory because, in Aristotle's view, rational agents necessarily choose and deliberate with a view to their ultimate good, which is happiness. It is the ultimate end since we want it for its own sake and we want other things for its sake. To find a more def uh, definite I'm sorry, account of happiness, Aristotle argues from the human function the characteristic activity that is essential to a human being in the same way as purely Nutritive life is essential to a plant, and a life guided by sense, perception, and desire is essential to an animal. Since a human being is essentially a rational agent, the function of a human being is a life guided by practical reason. And I do want to underline reason. You know, maybe um, this reminds you of some things, because, well, the thing is, is reason the same as meaning? Well, I think it is highly correlated or it is highly um, familiar. Can I say familiar? I don't know. I think you know what I mean, but meaning and reason is, is quite the same. Not exactly the same. I mean, some people that really do uh, value defini definitions of words, which is definitely not who I am, um, are going to point out, no, it's not the same. It is similar though. But anyway, Victor Frankl was talking about and has always been talking about meaning in life and the importance of having meaning in life. And I do want to say, and I do want to point out, and I do want to underline, and I do uh, have to admit, you know, if I want to or not, that yes, it is a really big part of life. You know, if I find meaning in suffering, whatever type of suffering it might be, I'm going to go through that suffering. But if I don't find any meaning, if there's no purpose in me suffering, then well, I'm not going to have that great chances. And as I've been thinking about that, I guess it was yesterday. Might have also been today. I don't know. But when I work out, this is suffering as well. But there is meaning behind it. There's a purpose behind my suffering. You know, I want to train my body. I want to be better. I want to look better. I want to be strong. I want to be whatever. But there is meaning behind it. 
You know, there's a reason why I'm doing that. And so, and so it makes sense that, that, it, that this type of suffering, because, I mean, it is physical suffering, is not as staggering. It's not as, as um, it's not hurting me as much as some other type of suffering, you know, maybe being tortured or, or whatnot, you know. Might actually be something that's very, I mean, of course, uh, talking about torture and, and exercising in, you know, the same sentence or in the same context, well, uh, it's a bit overdone, of course. I mean, torture is definitely something that's way more extreme, but, um, you know, it hurts. Exercising hurts as well, but might be something subconscious, actually, you know, that I know that there is purpose behind it, and so it's it's not that much pain. On the other hand, for somebody that does really not like or actually really hates exercising, might actually be way more pain. I don't know. Maybe there's actually some studies on that. Could be interesting. The human good, therefore, is an activity of the soul in accordance with complete virtue in a complete life. Aristotle claims that virtuous activity controls happiness. If virtuous activity controls happiness, we need to know what the relevant virtues are to secure happiness. So, to be a generous person, I must not only know how to give money on the right occasions and have generous impulses, I must also direct my capacities and feelings to the right goals so that I act from the right desires, for the right reasons and on the right occasions. The right moral choice requires experience of particular situations, since general rules cannot be applied mechanically to particular situations. Incontinence or weakness of will. Well, isn't incontinence also when I pee myself just all the time? You know, because I'm... I think it is lack of voluntary control over urination. I guess that there is actually a spelling mistake, isn't it? Or weakness of will. Incontinence. Well, I think... <laughs> I think it's definitely not the right word. Weakness of will. Inconsciousness? Could, well, I know, probably not. Anyway, is usually taken to consist in knowing that X is better than Y, but choosing Y nonetheless. Well, one could also say it's just dumb, isn't it? You know, or couldn't I? The value of this pleasure depends on the value of the activity on which the pleasure follows. The virtuous person has the most pleasant life, but this life cannot be devoted exclusively to the pursuit of pleasure. All three of the main types of friendship for pleasure, for advantage, and for the good, are concerned with the good over the other person. But only the best sort of friendship, friendship for the good between virtuous people, evolves A's concern for B's good for B's own sake and for B's essential character. So both, apparently, as I'm getting that correctly, get as much out of it as the other person. You know, they get um, the same amount of you know what it is pleasure or value out of the uh, um, relationship which I think if you think about it is 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 amazing which might also be one of the reasons why I think and I heavily dislike relying too much on other people in terms of asking for too much without being asked as well you know if somebody I mean on I, I totally have to say, I mean, if somebody comes up, a good friend of mine, and it's like, well, could you please help me? And he's doing that, I, I mean, a hundred times, I'm going to be fine with it. I don't care. But it is something that I, for myself, dislike. You know, if I'm just asking without giving, I like giving. I like giving people shit. You know, I like doing that. But I don't like asking for things, you know. And I don't want to have the feeling of, um, asking for too much and therefore, well, also, uh, well, also having to pay them back basically, you know, so that I know, okay, you know, I, I have to pay them back in some or the other way eventually. Anyways, book one, happiness. In all such cases, then the ends of the ruling sciences are more choice worthy than all the ends subordinate to them, since the lower ends are also pursued for the sake of the higher. For even if the good is the same for a city as for an individual, still the good of the city is apparently a greater and more complete good to acquire and preserve. Each person judges right, rightly what he knows and is a good judge about that. 
Hence, the good judge in a given area is the person educated in that area, and the unqualifiedly good judges is the person educated in every area. And the unqualifiedly good judge is the person educated in every area. And I do also want to say, and uh, give that a bit more importance, hence the good judge in a given area is the person educated in that area. Which means, I mean, if you get advice from somebody that um, apparently and or you know about it is not educated in that space, well, why would you listen? On the other hand, though, and I do think this is what he means by saying, and the unqualifiedly good judge is the person educated in every area, might be a person that is in general um, highly educated, you know, in other spaces, and is deriving an opinion from these spaces um, into the, the other space that he is actually not educated or per se educated in. So... It always depends on the person, you know. If this person isn't knowledgeable in anything quite, then why would you listen? If this person is knowledgeable in something that is in some way related to what the fuck you need advice in, then, well, you probably should listen. Even though, I mean, on the third hand, one should always listen, you know. Even if the person is not knowledgeable at anything, maybe he or she is saying something that you get something from or you can make something out of. You know? Anyway, this is why a youth, a youth, is not a sustainable student of political science, for he lacks experience of the actions in life, which are the subject and premises of our arguments. Moreover, since he tends to follow his feelings, his study will be futile and useless, for the end of political science is action and not knowledge. Indeed, the same person often changes his mind, for when he has fallen ill, he thinks happiness is health, and when he has fallen into poverty, he thinks it is wealth. This is an amazing quote. For it would seem people quite uh, reasonably reach their conception of the good, i.e. of happiness, from the lives they lead, for there are roughly three most favored lives, the lives of gratification, of political activity, and third, of study. And I mean, they all have a purpose. Gratification, well, gratification, political activity, probably doing something and achieving something and making a difference, and study of, uh, well, studying and deriving quite pleasure from that and also purpose from that, you know? Might actually be me, to be honest. Anyway, the many, the most vulgar, would seem to conceive the good and happiness as pleasure and hence uh, they also like the life of gratification. In this, they appear completely slavish or slavish, since the life they decide on is a life for grazing animals. The cultivated people, those active in politics, and I don't necessarily think that he means politics in the, uh, um, like, general speaking, like politics, you know, just being a counselor or whatever. But maybe, maybe it's it's kind of a metaphor or or. I can stand for something else as well. Anyway, conceive the good as honor, since this is more or less the end normally pursued in the political life. Well, is it? You know, I actually would have said, you know, making a change and so on. I would seem, uh, it would seem, they pursue honor to conceive themselves that they are good. At any rate, they seek to be honored by prudent people among people who know them and for virtue. Perhaps, indeed, one might conceive virtue more than honor to be the end of the political life. However, this also is apparently too incomplete to be the good. For it seems possible for someone to possess virtue but be asleep or inactive throughout his life and moreover to suffer the worst evils and misfortunes. If this is the sort of life he leads, no one would count him happy except to defend a philosopher's paradox. The moneymaker life is in... Uh, is in a way forced on him, not chosen for itself, and clearly wealth is not the good we are seeking, since it is merely useful, choice-worthy only for some other end. Clearly then, goods are spoken of in two ways, and some are goods in their own right, and others good because of these. Let us then separate the goods in their own right from the merely useful goods, and consider whether goods in their own right respond to a single idea. Now happiness, more than anything else, seems complete without qualification, for we always choose it because of itself, never because of something else. 
That's completely the case. The same conclusion that happiness is complete also appears to follow from self-sufficiency. For the complete good seems to be self-sufficient. What we count as self-sufficient is not what sufficiencies uh, or not what suffices for a solitary person by himself living an isolated life, but what uh, suffices or whatever also for parents, children, wife, and in general for friends and fellow citizens, since a human being is a naturally political animal. Happiness, then, is apparently something completely and self-sufficient, since it is the end of the things achievable in action. For living is apparently shared with plants, but what we are looking for is the special function of a human being. Hence, we should set aside the life of nutrition and growth. The life next in order is some sort of the life, uh, is some sort of life of sense perception, but this too is apparently shared with horse, ox, and every animal. We have found then that the human function is activity of the soul in accord with reason or requiring reason. Activity of the soul in accord with reason. Moreover, we take the human function to be a certain kind of life and take this life to be activity and actions of the soul that evolve reason. Hence, the function of the excellent man is to do this well and finely. And so the human good proves to be activity of the soul in accord with virtue and indeed with the best and most complete virtue if there are more virtues than one. Goods are divided then into three types, some called external, some goods of the soul, others goods of the body. This also leads to a puzzle. Is happiness acquired by learning or habituation or by some other form of cultivation? Or is it the result of some divine fate or even of fortune? It is not surprising then that we regard neither ox nor horse nor any other kind of animal as happy, for none of them, for none of them can share in this sort of activity. For the same reason, a child is not happy either, since his age prevents him from doing these sorts of actions. If he is called happy, he is being congratulated simply because of anticipated blessedness. For as we have said, happiness requires both complete virtue and complete life. And with that being said, this is going to be it for book one. Book two is going to be about virtue of character. I hope that you've been able to get something out of it and um, that you've learned something. And I'm going to see you the next time. So, bye-bye.